Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I know um, some more people may trickle in to the Zoom as we get going, but welcome everybody to the IHPI seminar uh, this afternoon. We are thrilled to have uh, some guests speaking with us today. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Lori Buis from the Department of Family Medicine and also a member of the IHPI institution leadership team who will have the pleasure of introducing our speakers. Then we will jump right into the presentation and the seminar. Um, please feel free to type your questions in the chat with the exception of clarifying questions. We will hold them till the end and hope to have some time for discussion and I'll monitor those and probably ask you to unmute and ask your question if we have time. But if you have any clarifying questions that need answering immediately, go ahead and put those in and we'll try to pause and get those answered. So thanks so much again. And um, Dr. Buis, please. Thanks, Sarah. So welcome everyone today. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. We have Dr. Lee Green and Dr. Terrence McDonald. Dr. Green is a practicing family physician and health services researcher at the University of Alberta, where he's a professor and the immediate past chair of the Department of Family Medicine. He also serves as a medical director for the university's physician learning program. Um, just to point out a nice connection, Dr. Green is also a professor emeritus here at U of M, where he's a member of the Department of Family Medicine and IHPI. Dr. Green's primary research focus is transformational change in primary care, where he's pioneered the adaptation of cognitive science and systems engineering tools, such as cognitive task analysis, to study primary care delivery, teamwork, and the medical home model. A lot of his work focuses on using mixed methods approaches. Um, our other speaker for today is Dr. Terrence McDonald, who is also a practicing family physician and health services researcher. He's currently at the University of Calgary, where he's an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and the Department of Community Health Sciences at the Cummings School of Medicine. Dr. McDonald first met Dr. Green while working on his master's in health economics, policy and management at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Dr. McDonald's research focus is workforce supply and continuity in primary care. He's developed a novel service day methodology for calculating physician supply, and the majority of his work uses quantitative methods. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Drs. Lee and, uh, sorry, Drs. Green and McDonald. Thank you, Dr. Pierce, uh, for that very kind uh, introduction and, uh, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to the group today um, and to the, those at the IHPI leadership and um, all their team for helping us uh, put this together today. Um, I'm coming to you kind of live from my clinic in Northeast Calgary. I'm a family doctor of 17 years, and I've known Lee Green since 2015 uh, when we connected on my master's thesis at London School of Economics. So today, I'm hoping we can have a very much an engaged discussion uh, following our presentation on the work that we've been kind of culminating over the last um, eight, nine years. For Lee, it's extended, I think, even beyond that over 10 years here in this, uh, in this province. Um, today, I'm going to go through a little bit of the work that we are doing um, together uh, and then some of the work that Lee's um, uh, doing from a qualitative perspective with his own team at the University of Alberta. Um, today uh, I'm excited to present some even fresh results that we've been working on over the last week or so and we'll uh, certainly entertain questions at, at the end. Today uh, we're going to be, next slide, we're going to be really talking a lot about, um, uh, first we have no conflicts of interest to declare, next slide. We're going to be really just kind of talking a lot about um, healthcare in one Canadian province. Um, Alberta is special as a Western Canadian province, province uh, because it has an, an incredible amount of health administrative data that's ex relatively accessible and can connect patients to providers and to clinics. And so we have that um, very powerful opportunity to look with a fairly good lens of on what the patterns of care are and certainly from a workforce perspective of what's actually happening on, on the ground for the most part. So a little bit of an overview of Alberta. 
followed by some quantitative examples and then the qualitative piece, and then we'll get into some discussions. For those of you who know uh, Dr. Green, uh, he, you know that he likes tea. Uh, I have said this a number of occasions uh, presenting in diff different provinces, but we met over tea in 2015, and he's been a, um, a friend uh, and mentor, and I've learned a, a great amount from his knowledge and expertise around things. Uh, he still is a family physician like me, and so we are uh, in the trenches, so to speak, in uh, trying to uh, influence policy and ask good questions of, of primary care in this province. Next slide. And the next slide. So to start population wise, uh, Alberta has seen a relatively, I would say, um, strong growth in population, over, particularly over the last two years. Uh, and that is an important piece to keep in mind as we go forward in the research. Um, as our population grows, uh, you'll see that our workforce from a primary care perspective has not kept pace. And you'll notice the green line on, to the far right on this um, on this graph that uh, we have um, uh, an are the growth in population is mostly uh, occurring from an, uh, an international um, uh, migration that uh, is consistent in multiple provinces across uh, across Canada right now, and I know in the U.S. as well. Next slide. So the health system structure in Alberta is. Um, I would say unique uh, for Canada uh, in that um, it has um, uh, primary care networks, which I will get into, but it's broken down into five health service zones. Um, essentially, uh, the Alberta government, known as Alberta Health, um, is the funder, the single funder, the single payer, and the health authority that helps to deliver that service is called Alberta Health Services. Um, we are broken down into, essentially, from a geographic perspective, perspective specifically geographically speaking um, from a distance point of view into about 132 regions we have five health zones that are used for planning operational uh, operational and uh, from an operational point of view uh, and delivery as well as some research uh, from these zones I'm coming to you from zone number four which is the Calgary metropolitan area and surrounding areas Lee is working in the Edmonton zone and surrounding areas which is zone number Number um, number two. Next slide. So, uh, um, like many like many accolades uh, that Alberta has, being an oil and gas uh, province uh, and a cattle and farming. Um, uh, mainstay in, in Canada as well. We have the notoriety of having the most uh, family physician, uh, physicians and physicians in general that uh, use a fee-for-service only model of payment. So we have that um, we have that award for Canada as being the, still the highest, and we have seen a very slow progression to different models, in, in, including capitation, salary, or other. And so we will speak to that as we go forward. So some of our research is really starting to uh, ask. Uh, or sorry, is starting to um, uh, question um, the the pace and and how we are transitioning uh, to other models other than, than fee for service. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, Alberta is fairly unique in Canada as. Uh, back in the um, late 90s and early 2000s, we this province took advantage of a fairly large um, federal uh, Canadian government uh, offering of finances, and, and they invested uh, quite well into essentially a primary care network system that spans the entire province. Uh, these networks are designed to support the work of um, clinics and primary care teams and uh, individual physicians in providing care to, to patients. And there's 39 across the province some have amalgamated more recently. Uh, we have about over 4,000 physicians and then over 1,600 other healthcare providers that are working in primary care um, networks throughout the, the province. Next slide. So amongst the, this is a little bit of an, some older data, but just to give you a sense of what, what we look like on the map. So to the wet, to the left is uh, British Columbia, to the right is Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, of course, to our south is our, our, our good friends and neighbors in the United States. Um, we have about uh, about 73% of clinics across the province, at least in 2019, that were affiliated with a primary care network. And, and why that's important to just to kind of understand from a system point of view is that the government will pay uh, a capitated fee for each 
uh, each patient that's registered to Family Doc uh, and their clinic annually that will support um, team-based programming, and that might be um, access to a dietitian, a physiotherapist, um, a, 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 psycho a psychologist. We believe some uh, a number of clinics that are are still not taking advantage of uh, that that public offerings. And next slide. So Albert, um, it is. Um, it is also facing the same challenges as we see across the, this country and, and uh, certainly in the United States and, and throughout um, other uh, Western countries and, and other countries across the world. We have a shortage of family physicians. We're dealing with a post uh, a burnout scenario, par pardon me, a post COVID uh, scenario, when in fact, um, I, I, I hate to say post, it's per peri post, I would say, where our, our numbers are back up again with COVID. Physicians and their teams are very tired. We have challenge around providing care to an aging population uh, who are more complex medically than ever. And uh, we're dealing again with uh, resource management and, and some poor planning, unfortunately, with um, in our in Alberta, most recent change in government over the last three to four years. Next slide. So the current kind of, we'll call this um, a bit of a state uh, um, a, a report card of, of what the current state. So what we're seeing in Alberta today is, again, that shortage of family physicians. One in five adults um, in Alberta don't have a family doctor. Many are having uh, a great deal have a uh, great deal of difficulty actually just getting an, an, an appointment uh, for timely care, which is then backlogging our urgent care centers and our, our, our emergency rooms. We have a number of... Uh, a new number uh, from this past September of, of, of less than 100 and less than 200 family, family docs actually even um, offering to take on new patients, which is, which again is, uh, I think, reflective of a multiple factors that I uh, mentioned before, whether it be simply they're just too burnt out, they don't have capacity, uh, the payment model is not, um, is not uh, assisting in this regard as well. And we'll talk about that um, shortly. Next slide. So a lot of the work that Dr. Green and I have been doing has used a very, very large data set, as I mentioned. Um, the data is uh, provided and kept by Alberta Health, the government, um, but it's also linked to a number of um, re data repositories that span, uh, as you can see on the right, everything from laboratory medicine, diagnostic medicine, uh, pharmaceutical, and ambulatory and inpatient care. So it's a very rich and powerful um, data set. And, and currently we have uh, about 15 years of organized data for every primary care physician and patient in, in, in this province, which is about 4 million. Next slide. So our, some, when Lee and I first met, um, I was actually doing master's um, in, at LSC while in practice, which was, a, which was a challenge for sure. But it was interesting, uh, I found, and fascinating. Um, my, the work that I did focused on high volume practitioners. So those family docs seeing more than 50 patients a day, and that was my dissertation. But it evolved from there to, um, um, to help us kind of develop a, how we're actually calculating physicians in, in Alberta. Um, Kai High, the Canadian Institute of Health um, Information, historically has been using these income percentile benchmarks to actually calculate more than or less than if one physician. So I've said to audiences um, in the past, we actually have been calculating 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 physicians, and we've actually been cal calculating less than 1.0 physicians, which is kind of an odd thing to actually uh, get your head around. But that those numbers, though, are actually then used as part of the numerator and, and denominator to calculate um, population uh, physician ratios, which we believe are not really indicative of what's happening on the ground, nor do we understand what they really mean when it comes to serving um, patients and a lot, um, in impacting access. So we decided to develop our own. We actually developed it um, based on the actual amount of service provided, not income. And we developed basically a part-time and, and full-time uh, definition. This methodology has been published. It's been reproduced in the uh, province of Ontario, and they're now using it as a little bit of a standard for future, um, future work on their supply of family docs. And we're very proud of this. Next slide. And, and 
from this research, we developed, we started uh, kind of getting a sense that there was more to the story around um, not just the discrepancy in when you apply two methods to calculate a workforce um, number, we, we actually started stumbled upon uh, two distinct groups of practitioners, those that are actually uh, part-time by service day, so they're working um, less than 138 days per year, seeing about 10 patients per day or more at $25 per value. Um, but there might be part-time by service provision, but they're actually full-time by income. So they're making more um, money, but working much, much less. And then we have the, found the opposite, where we have full-time docs, who, family docs, who are working uh, very hard from a service day perspective, but they're actually not making as much money. And we know that that's a choice that they're, they are making. That's a practice style. They're focusing on their, their we believe, their comprehensive uh, practices. And a lot of our research will continue to explore that. Next slide. And more, most recently, we just this was published just last month uh, in the Canadian Journal of, of Health Policy. We took kind of a, a quick um, a quick look at some of the uh, college data. So the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta ha is a complete registry of all physicians and surgeons. And so we know that the in order to practice, you need to have this um, this particular um, licensure updated and paid for. And so these numbers we believe are, are quite accurate. But we what we've seen in the last couple of years from 2018, and I will point out that we did have a change of government um, in 2019, I believe it was, into kind of more, much more of a United Conservative group, um, we saw this unusual number change. And, and it's important to note that uh, the number change included two groups. One, the very young in practice, so zero to five years in practice, or so our new grads, but that number actually dropped. And yearly, we have two medical schools, two programs in residency training. We are producing about 150 per year. So where did they go? So we know from exit surveys that a lot of these new docs are simply leaving this. Those docs, 31 plus years in practice also is down, but they account for about 25%. who've graduated over 30 years ago. And I know Dr. Green just um, very happily celebrated his 40th anniversary of graduating from medical school. So congratulations. The next slide. Gary, we're uh, losing your voice a bit. So you might want to drop your video and hang on to okay. your bandwidth there. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Just one second now. I'm going to try this again. Does that sound a bit better? Okay. Um, so just to recap then, the last slide really spoke to um, the problem of physician supply um, in, in actual numbers. New grads are leaving. The older docs uh, longer in practice, 30, 31 plus years from graduation. Uh, we know they're accounting for, uh, you know, close to 30% of our entire workforce, which is a problem because those folks are going to retire. Um, a lot of the work that we did on workforce supply really turned into questions then around, well, if we don't, if we're running low on supply, how can we best provide care that is, um, that will provide good outcomes? How can we, because we know provider continuity is well established as, uh, uh, as an effective means to um, improve patient health outcomes from primary care. But what about clinic? And so if we don't have enough um, docs to supply clinics um, and do docs are working more part time, what's the, the impact of clinic continuity? So we, we've been able to really isolate on, and on the left, you can see that we've used a KPC modeling, but then we developed our own kind of group care modeling where we've isolated that facility effect or that clinic effect where if you're not able to, if a patient's not able to see their own doc, they might be able to see um, their partner um, in that practice. And we can see, um, and we've done this analysis uh, at nauseum. It's under review right now for Annals of Family Medicine. And every time we, we run it, um, it's coming back with the same kind of message that there's some really good effects seen by um, not just the, um, the provider continuity, but that GCR clinic continuity. Next slide. And maybe I'll turn this over to, to Dr. Green there. If I can find my mute button, yes. So we have been doing this kind of work, kind of inspired by our colleagues in, uh, in Ontario, uh, Rick Glazer and Sue Schultz and others, 
uh, have been looking at uh, at the scope of practice uh, of, of family physicians. Uh, and so we took uh, a look at our data, our own data in the same way, and found that uh, we had a quite a substantial fraction of our family docs, about a quarter of them, not really providing um, comprehensive care. Now, some of those were were in specific focus practice, like they they just uh, quit doing primary care entirely. And although they're on the, the family medicine register through the college, they're just doing derm or they're just doing sports medicine or whatever. Uh, but uh, a larger number um, are not in a focused practice, but they're not really providing full spectrum continuity family medicine. So they're not really part of the workforce that can provide that continuity benefit that we demonstrated in the previous slide. Uh, and, and this is quite a, a significant issue for us. Again, looking at our capacity for providing primary care in Alberta, we've got a, a significant chunk of our family docs who aren't really doing that. So uh, again, just a, a nose count in uh, in the province doesn't give us a good estimate of what our capacity to take care of patients at the front line really is. Next slide. And Terry? Yes, um, sorry, yep. Okay. Uh, I think I think you can I can go ahead on this Lee, if you like light into it. Okay, so um, as I mentioned at the at the on uh, at the um, first off and starting the presentation, Alberta has the the um, the distinction of being the most uh, having the most um, fee for service family docs and physicians in general um, practicing um, by this single payment model. And well, so what we decided to do, um, knowing that we are um, as I mentioned, in the in the trenches, um, trying to influence policy and ask ask good questions, um, with the caveat that um, change is slow, uh, and the fever service model may not change. Obviously, in the next few years, we decided to look at one of the codes that allowed um, family docs to and providers in general to um, extend their visit uh, from fifteen minutes just to over um, to, from fifteen minutes from sixteen minutes to twenty four minutes, and they get paid a little bit more for that and it was the the timing of the code um, uh, set us up for this really nice opportunity to do a little bit of a time series analysis and what we found was following the introduction of, of the code there were very specific groups of family docs that used the code and chose to actually make less money then there were other docs who actually used the code a lot and they made more money but those that um those that were those users of this particular fee for service time extender code, uh, the highest group actually saw emergency room, room department visits and hospitalizations. Um, uh, they were less for this group, which is really an interesting finding, uh, uh, not just on its own, but also discovering that obviously other folks are um, using um, different codes uh, and choosing to use different codes to obviously make more money. Next, next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Green to to, to share some of that quality qualitative work he's he's been working on for a while. Okay, thanks. Um, actually, I can't resist a comment on the last slide. Can you go back one for us, Sarah? So, can you go back one slide, Sarah? There we are. So that last bullet, ultimately the policy change did not occur. Terry and I um, did this analysis and, and showed that the, the docs who make heavy use of the extended visit code um, make less money on the average, but their patients also spend less time in hospital and emerge. And we presented that and, uh, and, and we're preparing for publication. We were interviewed by CBC and it became rather a bit of a noise in the province. Um, uh, didn't necessarily please our minister of health, whose decision it was to uh, cancel the, the extended visit code. But, uh, but we were able to, through our work, we were able to quite directly impact policy and, uh, and our work contributed to the decision to reverse that decision and not drop the extended visit code. So yes, uh, a couple of family doctors were able to upset the apple cart a bit and, uh, and make a policy change. Um, okay, next slide. And the slide after that, there we are. So uh, as I say, I, I do, as Terry mentioned, I, I tend toward mixed methods research. 
The first uh, bundle that I'll present here is uh, some mostly qualitative research. It, it's a, a quantitative, qualitative, sequential model. We did look at some province-wide data with selecting places for this, much more so in the next one I'll present. But, but what we've been using is, uh, is cognitive task analysis, which is a highly structured set of uh, qualitative methods that I can enlarge upon at great detail. If anyone has questions, you have been warned. Uh, and uh, and uh, trying to elicit the mental models of physicians in different places on the diffusion of innovation curve. And I'm going to assume that most of our audience here has uh, is familiar with diffusion of innovation research. What we've uh, what we found is Alberta has had a chronic problem with stalling out innovations in the valley of death. And we have our grizzly bear in the valley of death there. Um, we get lots of lots of successful pilots. And, uh, and, and we suffer severely from pilotitis, the pilots don't go on to spread and scale. We felt that the reason for that was because the pilots were all designed around the mental models of the people who do pilots, the innovators and early adopters, and they just weren't getting traction with the early majority, let alone the late majority. So we went out to understand the mental models of team-based care of the, the medical home model, et cetera, um, with, of, of the early majority, specifically selecting for early majority docs. And, and we found, we did a whole set of, uh, a whole set of um, studies um, looking at the uh, uh, scaling up, we're looking at clinical pathways, opioid prescribing, you see a whole list there. And we did quite a set of studies, uh, most of which are published at this point. Um, and, and what we found is there are in fact market differences and, uh, and quite a spectrum, if I could, if you could see the next slide. Um, looking at team-based care, for example, we found there's quite a spectrum of physicians, uh, mental models from the physician-centric, you know, I'm the doctor, I hire some people to help me, through a true team-based care model of we take care of these patients. And not surprisingly, the, uh, the early adopter types were able to pretty quickly switch and pretty self-propelled to a more physician-centric model as the primary care networks were implemented and this, the team uh, staff became available and so forth. But the, uh, the docs who are sort of more the early majority group, they need coaching, they need practice facilitation and work on specific skills to be able to move toward that team-based care model. And what we discovered is those skills are measurable, quantifiable, and you can train a practice facilitated workforce to help physicians and practices navigate the, the practice, uh, navigate the process of gaining those skills and transitioning their care model. Uh, and that, that's underway in, uh, in the primary care networks in Alberta now with their practice facilitators. Next slide. And this is very much a, uh, a sequential, uh, a quantitative, quanti qualitative sequential model. And it will go back to quantitative again. Um, the work that Terry has been doing on claims data has been used to inform our selection of physicians and patients in rural communities to do cognitive task analyses to understand um, and do a proper human-centered design effort on cancer diagnosis support um, and cancer uh, diagnosis care pathways in rural areas, which will then go on to be implemented and again, have a quantitative analysis and follow-up cognitive task analyses to see the changes that we've accomplished in mental models. So this is very much an iterative uh, mixed methods approach based on, uh, again, the, the research that Terry and I have been doing and, uh, and introducing this uh, cognitive science method to it. Okay, and next slide, and Terry. So you can see cool. some of the things we've been able to do when we have, uh, when we have access to basically a universal data set in an entire province. So, so where does this leave us now as far as policy direction? And, and that's what we're most most keen to talk about with this group and share today. Next slide. Alberta is in a, I would say, a state of um, non-policy direction at this point um, as far as primary care. We have um, one initiative that's been proposed. Lee can speak to this in detail because he offered a white paper from his team at the University of Alberta. My department, the University of Calgary, um, presented uh, similarly. We have a... a uh, we've essentially a, um, a modernizing um, modernizing plan is 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 on paper, but nobody really knows what it means. So the opportunity for us to 
um, it, you know, be asking questions and continuing research to influence the direction we'd like to see government move with funding models and provide and um, team-based care. Um, you know, I think is th th it's certainly going to be a, a rich um, a rich health services research the next few years. The problem is, is that we, um, our data access more recently has kind of changed. We were no longer getting the same type of uh, data that we had in the past uh, for, for a variety of reasons we don't know. Uh, we know that we need to be working towards um, getting more up-to-date uh, data to, to, of course, um, move that dial as far as strengthening team-based care and strengthening the work um, of the physicians on the ground. Um, our recruitment, uh, our primary care recruitment strategies are, have changed slightly. We do see the college moving towards uh, fast-tracking some IMG um, international medical graduates um, into Alberta but it's still a very slow process. Medical education in Canada, um, we see less students choosing um, uh, family, family medicine as a career choice. And we're now um, moving towards, uh, I believe in 2027, a three-year training program finally, uh, which will also uh, create some issues with regards to supply, uh, supply of family docs on the ground. Um, but I think it's also, this is a, a great opportunity to, um, to um, be involved in those discussions. And like Lee said, we have uh, the opportunity to apply some of our methodology to, to support it. Uh, next slide. Certainly, really enjoy taking any questions from the audience. And I do want to send um, a huge thank you to Sarah Mer Mernigan on this call, who basically um, put a, a tremendous amount of work into this presentation. And um, we'd like to acknowledge the uh, other departments of family medicine in our province. Lee, I'll turn it over to you, maybe. Okay. So that's a whirlwind tour through uh, health services research at the uh, from a primary care perspective uh, in in the province of Alberta. To say we have. Because it is a single payer universal coverage system, we, we have outstanding data to, to work with. Caveats and challenges recently. Um, but, uh, but we also have a, a thing in Canada called the, uh, the SPORE, the Strategy for Patient Outcomes Research. Um, and, and the SPORE shop in Alberta uh, seems to uh, be in a position to help us get around the data access obstacles. Um, a few more uh, cumbersome processes, but uh, but we we're optimistic that we'll be able to continue working with these data. We've just gotten uh, gotten progress uh, the process going for getting the cancer follow up data, for example. Um, so we expect to continue on in this uh, vein and uh, see how we're doing and what we might need to change what we're doing as we try to address this uh, growing shortfall of primary care in the province of Alberta. So we'll throw it open to questions. If you folks have questions, they can um, either put them in the chat or raise your hand. I think we have enough time for you to raise your hand and ask your question um, while we're waiting for folks to think about that a little bit. Um, you alluded to this just at the end when you mentioned the cancer follow-up data. I, I wondered if you could share a little bit more about um, cancer survivorship care and how that interfaces with um, primary care and family medicine in particular in Canada. That's an area I'm particularly interested in is can we better utilize our primary care physicians I'm and others, I think maybe some of them on this call who focus on this area. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about that and maybe where you're going with that with the data that you just alluded to. Cancer survivorship care in Canada differs a bit by province because the the different provinces all have different healthcare systems. Um, folks sometimes mistakenly think that Canada has a national health system. It has 10 provincial and three uh, territorial systems, which do differ substantially one from another. The thing they have in common is that the Canada Health Act requires that they all cover a certain basic set of services. The provinces may elect to cover more things as well. But, uh, but in Alberta, which is fairly typical of Canada, the uh, care of cancer survivor patients does involve the family physician quite heavily, uh, more in rural areas than urban, but, uh, but in all areas, I mean, it is by design a primary care-based health system. So, so the, the oncology folks 
have neither the desire nor the bandwidth to take to to pro continue providing endless care for cancer survivors. They do transfer care back to the family physician, uh, usually with a detailed plan. The the information necessary to do that has always been a bit of an issue. We now have the province-wide connect care system slowly but surely <laughs> making the uh, 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 specialty care uh, records more available to the family physician out in the community. Um, my practice has very good access to them at this point. How, how are you folks doing uh, at your end, Terry? You use a different EMR than we do. Yeah, we, we, I have to sign on. Um, I do have access. Our staff do not, unfortunately, have access to it right now. But we do have access to another system, as you know, neck care. So um, I, I would just kind of echo, though, that when it comes to oncology patients, uh, cancer patients, survivors, we we often see them lost uh, into the specialty world and come back, but they do come back. And um, um, I, in my own practice, which is a teaching practice, I try to engage and continue to engage oncology, but they're very busy. And what we're seeing anecdotally um, with the shortage of family docs, you see a little bit of primary care creeping into some of the specialist care. And I've had specialists comment to me kind of saying, you know, I, I don't really know if this is the right cream for what I saw. Can you can you help me? Um, so, and and they don't want to be in that space. To be honest, uh, we are we are experts as in generalism. We're experts in the delivery of, of primary care, and they are not. So, yeah. Thank you. That's um. <clears throat> sounds like it's a bit. Th that's where we'd love to be headed. We, we myself and some others kind of researching in this space to have more involvement of primary care, more what you're talking about. So. Um, we may follow up with you with some additional questions about your thoughts. Um, that, that's a that's one example of kind of a broader area that we are studying also is transitions of care, mm -hmm. uh, not just with cancer survivorship, but but transitions from primary care to specialty care and back again. Um, we have just completed one set of and are in the throes of another set of cognitive task analyses looking at the care pathways for transitions of care for cirrhosis patients, for example. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing yeah. challenge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just, uh, it's not just oncology. Um, that's just a particular interest of mine, but um, for sure the transitions across primary specialty um, we do at least have a guidepost in Canada, which is that there is supposed to be a transition. Yeah. Ultimately, the, the the primary care physician is supposed to, you know, be the be the quarterback for the ongoing care. So, yeah. so hi, I had a quick question. Oh, hey, Sarah. hi, Lee. We've met. Hi, it's Trish Meyer. Um, I am not a physician. I'm the managing director of IHPI, but I was just curious, and I apologize if you touched on this because I actually had to take a quick phone call during your presentation, but are there, I mean, I know that it's a very specific situation there that you're looking at, but do you feel like there are some lessons that can also be applied to U.S. healthcare um, from what you've learned or, yeah? Well, uh, yes, I think there are. Um... One is the importance of primary care policy. Right. Uh, that is, I mean, that's probably the biggest difference that I see having practiced in and taught in and done research in both systems. Um, the, the U.S. doesn't really have what I would call a workforce policy. There's support for graduate medical education, but it's funneled through Medicare and through the hospitals and, and, it, it's really a very diffuse sort of decision process about what who gets trained and and uh, and what specialties, what the balance is, and that sort of thing. It's very much up to a lot of the hospitals. It's quite different on the on the Canadian side of the border. Uh, graduate medical education funding goes directly to the residency programs. It's not controlled by hospitals, hmm. and it's a it's a, a matter of policy and it's it's a decision that's made at the ministries of health um as as to you know what what kind of specialties we need and so forth so for example at this point the ministry has recognized that we we really need a substantial increase in the number of family physicians that we're training and so they have 
They have funded additional training positions and additional faculty positions in the departments at Calgary and Edmonton um, for that purpose. Um, that I think is a, a, a lesson for the US, um, more at the micro level um, and perhaps less policy is, uh, is uh, you know, Terry's, uh, Terry's discussion of the, of the service day methodology. I think it's, it's worth the US taking a look at that as well because a family doc is not a family doc is not a family doc. You have to know exactly what care they're delivering. And then I, I personally, I think the, the thing that translates the best is the, the work we've done on continuity of care. Mm -hmm. Because as the number of people in primary care who choose to practice part-time increases, you are able to depend less and less on that direct single physician continuity. Right. So you've got more reliance on the group. And what we've shown is that if you see, if, if you can't see me, you see one of my partners at the same, in the same practice, that's a substantial benefit in terms of reduced emerge and, uh, and hospitalization utilization. Hmm versus if you go to an urgent care or walk-in clinic or whatever that has that you know where you're not a regular continuity patient and 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 that I think matters quite a bit in the uh, in in what insurance companies should be incentivizing in what health systems should be providing support for um, more more medi centers is not the way you know more team based right. care is the way thank you And does that include um, when you're talking about the continuity with with clinics, um, like advanced practice practitioners as well? Like if the patient can't see you, might they see um, like a nurse practitioner level provider and still have that same level of continuity? Well, we'd Are like you? to be able to answer that, but we don't <laughs> really have a good answer for it because we have so few primary care nurse you. practitioners in Alberta that okay. we don't have the data. That's that's one of the big deficits in Alberta is uh, is that we we have very few um, non physician providers, uh, and that's something that you know we we hope to address over the next ten years, but it's going to take ten years to make a dent in it. Um, there is a question in the chat, but it's kind of similar to that. Um, it's it it asks about. Um, how do you see your research from Jessica uh, Burns? How do you see a research model being transferred to other medical professions within primary care clinics, such as medical assistants? Maybe that's a little bit of a step beyond. Do you see that being uh, like a, a model that could be transferred? And maybe that's something, um, maybe with some collaboration with some US colleagues to sort of look at um, in, in clinics here where they do have more of those types of. Yeah. I, I'm I'm afraid I might have lost Terry. Um, hopefully he can reconnect. I, Terry has some bandwidth issues at his clinic sometimes. So anyway, um, I'll, until he pops back in, at least I'll take a uh, take a run at that. Um, the answer is yes. We would like to extend our our research to looking at the whole team. We suspect that part of the value of this group care rate that we've discovered um, is that if you see one of my partners instead of me. You still got the same nurse and medical office assistant and so forth, so you are still seeing people who know you. Um, we don't, we can't say that based on data because we haven't analyzed it that way yet. We don't have access to that level of detail yet. But again, we get into this mixed methods kind of stuff. We can then select practices and go out and 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 look to see how much of the how much continuity there is with the rest of the team and so forth. So, you know, there, there's a whole range of further things we can, I mean, every one of these studies brings up another 10 questions <laughs> and, and that's one of them for certain. <clears throat> so yes, we would very much like to, to extend this to, uh, to the other health professions and in particular to the, the um, people that, that the patient sees regularly in the clinic. I just got a ping from Terry. Uh, his internet went down. Darn. Oh. Okay, so I will uh, I will hold the fort until Terry's internet comes back. Um, let me just uh, let him text him. And uh, 
Other questions? Oh, I just saw him pop back on. Sorry about that. My internet just died. Um, so I, my, my sincere apologies. <laughs> okay. All right. So Terry, I was just uh, answering a question we had about other health professions, like the, the effect of, uh, of the, the, the rest of the team, um, you know, the, the uh, office assistants, medical office assistants, um, et cetera, and you know, an area obviously that we haven't researched yet, but that we would we would like to. Well, I think the other the other component that as we've talked about is that is that um, that that management financial management level of actually running a capitated model within a clinic is really missing. Um, and the, I think there's such a rich opportunity there to explore, um, you know, why that is. I know what you'd mentioned before, Lee, University of Michigan had, would have these seminar series on weekends to help train staff to actually help docs understand how to run a capitated model business. Um, and that's really, you know, I think um, it's missing here uh, in Alberta and probably missing in other parts of the country. So. Yeah, that, that's one of our big barriers. You know, as, as Terry mentioned, we have we have the lowest uptake of alternative payment plans in Canada. Um, cap, we have capitation plans, and the practices that are using them are doing wonderfully. And they can, you know, they can support a team better. They can take larger panels of patients. It's a more efficient, more effective. And they have, you know, they have better outcomes. All the good stuff that you get from from a well-run capitated plan. The problem is we don't have training programs in the U S to teach physicians how to manage a capitated practice, how to, how to make a living at it. So we have this, this large number of docs who know how to make a living running a fee for service practice. And we're asking them to, to change to a different model that they don't necessarily have the skills to operate. And, and they don't want to, they don't want to risk their families, you know, roof over their head <laughs> based on a business model, they don't know how to work. And it, it's still very much, you know, in Canada, it's still very much kind of the 1970s um, cottage industry with physician owned small practices um, being the, the dominant model. One of the things we're hearing from our new residency graduates is that they don't wanna run a business. They wanna go out and practice medicine and they would rather just be part of a well-run practice. So, we're looking at how how to, especially our colleagues in Ontario, but we as well, are looking at how we can uh, perhaps help facilitate that, and uh, and and see if that is a solution to increasing recruitment into family medicine. And I would say anecdotally, I mean, even having a conversation with my own family doctor this past summer, I said, well, what about if the primary care network were to purchase your clinic? He said, here's the keys. He didn't even he didn't even hesitate. One second, he said. So you'd come in, I would work, and you take care of all my human resource issues, and all of the overhead. And I'd say, yeah, maybe. I, he said, yes, hundred percent. I mean, it's just telling. I mean, doc, the docs are tired. We're not. I'm not a business person. Most docs are not business people. We're not minded that way. We like to do medicine. So, um, again, I think a really uh, opportunities are there, and maybe we have a lot to learn also in how HMOs have operated. And, and, and I'm not an expert in any in any part of uh, U.S. healthcare, but like there's a message there that um, you can do it better and efficiently. Um, it just it just hasn't been present here. So, other questions, comments, thoughts people have. Other questions? What about telehealth um, and how, how does that play into any of what you're talking about? How, I mean, I'm seeing that Terry's having trouble with his internet and I can appreciate that because I also live in a rural area. Um, is that a problem? Is that well, an opportunity? Yeah. We've only just started having any reasonable payment. Uh, again, it's so much fee for yeah, service because the family exactly. weren't doing anything like that because it didn't pay. Um, and there was actually a limit on the number of physician of, of telephone calls, patient phone calls that you could bill for in a week. It was like five was the max. Uh, that that cap was lifted with COVID because we had to do so many virtual visits. Right. Uh, 
but it's still, I mean, even before COVID, Kaiser was running like 40% of their primary care visits were virtual. And, and we, we've lagged far, far behind that in Canada in general and in Alberta in particular. Um, it's certainly coming up a lot now. Um, virtual care is probably 15-ish percent of my practice when I'm in Alberta. Um, at the moment, I'm here at IHPI um, this month, but uh, but I'm actually still doing virtual care with my patients back there. So I'm I'm doing I'm doing a you know a dozen visits a week probably um, remotely from here. Now, what's what's it like at your end, Terry? Uh, I, I think I'd have two two comments that, that come easily to mind around that question because we're seeing there's essentially two types of virtual care. So it's the virtual care in my practice that I actually do with either a video call or um, a phone call. The, the, I happen to be in a, the back office here. So that's why the reception so bad. But it is, you know, virtual care has been very helpful for, for, for patients, particularly who work shift work late at night, et cetera, where access is a problem. It actually has revolutionized some of that. And cares that cares is being offered and provided uh, for but the limitations of not being able to do a physical exam and lay eyes on a patient uh, li or lay a hand on their shoulder or talk to them um, and that's what family docs do best is, is connecting with people uh, has you know has it is a different type of practice the residents are learning uh, in this practice which I think is a, a bit of a double-edged sword uh, because they need to learn that art that communication um, but the other the other comment I would make um, and that we're seeing is that private companies have, have emerged that provide only virtual care. And so what we're seeing now is a duplication of care processes of, of our patients. So if the patient can't get in to see me, they'll go online and book an appointment with Maple Leaf or whoever. And then what happens is their care plan is not articulated or communicated and there might be a change. And it's, it can be very problematic. And you see this discontinuity then occur. And that's, that's a, that runs contrary to, I think, what we're trying to accomplish. So We haven't studied that yet, but maybe yeah. that's on our menu, Terry. Well, we sh yeah, that's definitely happening here too, just what you said. Even you know people going around can't get an appointment, so they go and hop on the online dermatology appointment and get an appointment that day. And um, yeah, something for us to think about, Trish, in the tele telehealth uh, incubator, um, how that's impacting. Perhaps we well, should if you, well, if you need, collaborate. If, if you need, if you need data, we have uh, we have access. Um, that virtual care really exploded. Uh, probably, uh, I would say about six months after. Uh, COVID, different provinces lagged um, in payment payment systems. A lot of family docs almost went, um, you know, went bankrupt or lost a lot. Well, I have colleagues who were paying their staff more than they were making. Um, so it was a really difficult time, um, but it, I think it's worth exploring. Absolutely. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. Thank you so much. That That's really fascinating. Um, I'm writing some notes down for things to potentially follow up on and um, think about. I'm sure others are as well. Um, I don't have see any other please. questions in the chat and I don't see any other hands. If folks do have other questions that you think of down the road, you can see Terry's and my emails at the, at the bottom of the screen there. You can always launch us uh, queries. And yes, you may receive some, some follow-ups. Um, Thank you so much for taking this time to talk with us. I think there's lots of lots of food for thought and lots of potential things maybe to turn into collaborations or ideas to at least continue discussing together. Very much appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Really, really enjoyed it. I wish I was on campus, but someday. <laughs> Another yes. time. We'd love to have you on. on Take care, Thanks to both of you. Bye. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Take Thanks care. everyone. Take care.